all you derby people out there and welcome to another jam-packed video brought to you by your host prim reaper if you're new to roller derby or you're just looking to learn a little bit more about this sport then this video is for you i really wanted to provide an overview for skaters or roller derby fans to learn the rules because there are just so many of them out there and it can be really overwhelming when you're just starting out to have to read all the million bajillion words in the rule book that can be pretty confusing at times. So I'm hoping that this video format is a little bit more accessible for you guys and really provide some context about some of the most common penalties in roller derby and what not to do during a game to make sure that you stay out of the box. I have scoured the internet for memes and gifs to try and make this the most visually appealing and entertaining presentation for you guys. Um, I really wanted this to be something a little informal and easy to follow along. You can also download the slides for this PowerPoint in the description box below if you'd like to have a copy for yourself. Now, before we get started, I do want to preface by saying that this video is an overview and it doesn't cover all of the little caveats that come along with our sport, but hopefully it does give you a good foundation before you step on the track or before you watch your first roller derby game. I really stress to new skaters that learning the rules of roller derby is one of the biggest things you can do to become a better player. The higher your derby IQ is, the more you know about roller derby and what to do and what not to do, um, the more successful and more valuable you will be. So I hope that this video serves as a great resource for you, your team, and the rest of the roller derby community. And without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so what does it mean to get a penalty in roller derby? Basically, you broke the rules, Oops. a ref saw you, and now you have to sit in timeout, aka the penalty box. I'll go ahead and say now, make sure you stay tuned until the end of the video when I go over how to get to the box and what happens when you're there. But for now, we are going to go over the actual penalties that can land you a seat in the box. And there are actually quite a lot, so let's get right into them. All right, we are going to start with target zone penalties. We all know and love roller derby because it's a full contact sport where you get to hit people on skates. However, there are many rules in place to make sure that we are engaging in contact safely. So with that being said, you can only make contact to another skater at specific target zones. And these are highlighted in pink in the diagram shown on the right. Target zones are where you can hit another skater. In other words, target zones are what you can make contact to. So you'll see it starts below the neck and ends at the lower thigh. The front of the body is fair game to hit, but the back of the body comes with more restrictions. Please make note of the white streak down the middle of the back, butt, and thighs that you are not allowed to hit. Okay, so now that we've established target zones, if you do make contact to any of the areas in white, you risk getting a back block, high block, or low block penalty, which we will go over. First up, we have the back block penalty. If you hit an opposing skater square in the back, the butt, or the back of the thighs, like we mentioned earlier, you will be issued a back block penalty. So you can see that the GIF here does a pretty good job showing what it might actually look like during the game. And we also have the referee cue in the bottom corner. So if you committed a back block, you would see a ref give you this hand signal and cue you to go to the penalty box by calling your team color, skater number, and the penalty you committed, which in this case would be back block. So for example, it would sound something like pink 775, back block. And then I would go to the box because that's my jersey color and my jersey number. 
But more on this later. I just wanted to give a brief intro to referee cues because they're in almost all of the slides going forward. So hint, hint, make sure you're giving those a little peek as well. Okay, so next we have the high block penalty. If you hit an opposing skater above the shoulders to the neck or the head, you will be issued a high block penalty. And finally, we have the low block penalty. If you make contact with anyone below the lower thigh and cause them to stumble, trip, or fall, you will be issued a low block penalty. Oftentimes this happens when you accidentally trip someone or if you fall and cause someone to trip over you. Next, we are going to talk about blocking zones. So the premise here is that you can only make contact to another skater using specific blocking zones. So shown in pink on this new diagram are parts of your body that you can use to hit other people. Just to recap quickly, we previously talked about target zones, which are body parts you can make contact to on an opposing skater. Now we are going to talk about blocking zones, which are what you can use to make contact with on your body. Perfect, so you can use nearly all of your body, starting from the neck down to your lower thighs, minus your elbows down to your hands. If you do make contact using any of the areas in white, you risk getting a head block, forearm, or leg block penalty. Okay, number one no-no is blocking with the head. You may not use your head to make contact, it's just dangerous for everyone. If you block someone with your head, you will get a blocking with the head penalty. Next, we have the forearm penalty. If you use your forearms, elbows, or hands to block, grab, hold, push, whatever, to an opposing skater, you will receive a forearm penalty. Jammers, if you are trying to get through a wall, do not do what the woman in this gif is doing. That is simply not allowed. And of course, you can't forget the leg block. If you use the portion of your leg below your lower thigh to block another skater, you will get a leg block penalty. The gif here is pretty dramatic, but hopefully you get the point. Great, now if you thought we were done with penalties, you were wrong. We still have plenty more to go. You serious? But this is all to keep us safe and prohibit dangerous play, so there are some more illegal contact penalties that we need to go over. All right, so deep breath. <laughs> These include direction, multiplayer, or just a hey, you made contact when you weren't supposed to, and you get a general illegal contact penalty. So you have direction, multiplayer, and illegal contact, which is an umbrella term that has its own handful of penalties underneath as subcategories. Direction and multiplayer have their own referee cues, but all illegal contact penalties use the one shown to the right. First up, we have direction of gameplay, which is actually my favorite penalty, and I love when it gets called. As the rules of Derby state, you have to be moving in the counterclockwise direction, aka Derby direction, while executing a block. If you move clockwise or if you are completely stopped and you make contact to an opposing skater, you will be issued a direction of gameplay penalty. So like Kevin Hart here, always make sure you're moving Derby direction. And if you're not, then turn around before you hit someone and get sent to the box. And not from period. Next, we have the multiplayer block. You are not allowed to grab or hold on to your own team to block an opposing skater. If you hold on to your teammate, whether it be their arm, their hand, their jersey, etc., and you form an impenetrable connection to block an opposing skater, you will be issued a multiplayer penalty. I do want to point out that these multiplayer penalties are only issued if the impenetrable connection between you and your teammate is being directly challenged. Okay, we are going to fly through these next couple of penalties. Here we have hitting a down skater, which is pretty self-explanatory and is when you make contact to an opposing skater that is on the ground and not upright. 
The gif here is also just a little bit dramatic, but the point is make sure that you're hitting fellow skaters that are upright. On the flip side, you can also get a hitting while down penalty, and this is just when you make contact to an opposing skater while you yourself are not upright. So you cannot make contact while you're crawling on the ground, you gotta be upright and on your skates. All right, another self-explanatory one is out of bounds block, which covers contact to an opposing skater either while you are out of bounds or while they are out of bounds. So that means all contact in derby has to happen on the track. In addition to that, all contact must also happen while you are grounded. If you make contact to an opposing skater while you are in the air with both feet off the ground, aka while you are jumping, then you will receive a leaping contact penalty. So, all of the things we just talked about also applies to assisting your teammates or yourself. If you give or receive an assist while you are out of bounds, out of play, which we'll talk about soon, not upright, moving clockwise, or stopped, then you will get an illegal assist penalty. Everything in roller derby, including assists, has to be done according to the rules of contact. And adding to what constitutes illegal contact is when you're doing it. Like I said before, you can only make contact during an active jam. With that being said, if you hit an opposing skater before the jam has started, you will get an early hit penalty. On the flip side, if you hit an opposing skater after the jam has finished, you will get a late hit penalty. Zounce away. Do not be extra, just play within the confines of an active jam. Now, finally, under illegal contact, we also have the out of play penalty. We know what out-of-bounds penalties look like, right? But what does it mean to be out of play, you ask? Well, first, we have to talk about the pack with the capital P because it is very, very, very important in roller derby. So listen up. <clears throat> the pack is the largest group of blockers. So jammers don't count here. I repeat, the largest group of blockers that contain skaters from both teams. Now, these skaters also have to be in bounds, upright, and within 10 feet of each other in order for the PAC, capital P, to exist. So you have the PAC, and you also have the Engagement Zone, capital E, capital Z. The Engagement Zone includes the PAC 20 feet ahead of whoever's at the front of the PAC and 20 feet behind whoever's at the back of the PAC. So here in the diagram on the right, the Spongebobs and Patricks make up the pack because they all fit the criteria we talked about a second ago. And then the engagement zone is shown by the dotted lines, 20 feet ahead and 20 feet behind. Conveniently, there are little 10 foot hash marks on the track that help with spacing. But anyways, the most important thing here is that you can only make contact to other skaters inside of the engagement zone, AKA within the dotted lines. This doesn't apply if you're a jammer hitting another jammer because that can happen anywhere on the track because jammers are special. But otherwise, all contact must be made within the engagement zone. So before we move on, let's go over a couple of examples of what the pack plus the engagement zone might look like in real life because this stuff is super duper important. In this first example on the left, we have the same pack I showed you in the previous slide and again, this constitutes a pack because we have what can be considered the largest group of blockers from both teams that are in bounds, upright, and all within 10 feet of each other. So you'll see the ref on the inside of the track saying, pack is here, yay. Now on the right side, we do not have a pack because we lost the 10 feet of proximity within blockers from both teams. And now there's like 23 feet separating the SpongeBob's and Patrick's. There are certainly two groups of blockers, but none of them fit the definition for a pack. The group of Spongebob's doesn't have any Patricks and vice versa, and there's no largest group of blockers with members from both teams that are within 10 feet of each other. Note here as well that when there's no pack indicated by the ref on the inside of the track, there's also no engagement zone, so the dotted lines disappear. 
Okay, a few more examples. On the left, we have a pack plus engagement zone because all of the criteria is met. However, in the middle, there is no pack. Now again, we have two groups of blockers and while this time each group contains members from both teams, neither group could be considered the largest because they're even, four and four. And also, there's more than 10 feet of separation. Now, within the same example on the right, we do have a pack because now we have a group of six blockers here, which contains SpongeBob's and Patrick's upright inbounds and within 10 feet of each other. There's also one Patrick that's within the engagement zone, so he's fine. But the other Patrick is way out in outer space, not in the engagement zone, and he doesn't count as a part of anything. Now, one last example, but hopefully by now you realize that the pack can look like many different things as long as it fits all of the criteria. The example on the left is actually pretty cool because this is the most spread out that blockers in the pack could ever get. You'll see that we have the group of blockers from both teams all within 10 feet of each other, besides the very front person who can be 20 feet away and the very back person who can also be 20 feet away because of the hashtag engagement zone that extends the pack. Now, with that being said, this is also a very fragile pack because with one little slip up, you could easily get a no pack. You'll see on the right, if Patrick were to step out of bounds, then we get a no pack because now nothing fits the criteria. We don't have that largest group of blockers from both teams within 10 feet of each other because one of the Patricks is out of bounds and ruined it all. Okie dokie, so hopefully now you understand a little bit more about the pack plus the engagement zone And now it's time to go back to the out of play penalty that we mentioned earlier. So I hope you remember that contact can only be made within the engagement zone. If you make contact to another skater outside of the engagement zone, so more than 20 feet in front or behind the pack, you will get an out of play penalty. I will say that this penalty is pretty avoidable because a ref will usually give you an out of play warning as soon as you skate outside of the engagement zone. The ref saying out of play is your cue to not make contact and get back in the engagement zone. In addition, out of play penalties also apply to making contact when there is no pack. Because when there's no pack, there's no engagement zone. And by default, you would be making contact not in the engagement zone because it doesn't exist when there is no pack. Big brain. So at this point, we have covered all of the illegal contact penalties. And now it's time to move on to the illegal position penalties. All right, so the premise of illegal position penalties is that you have to maintain the pack at all times. To recap what I said earlier, when the pack falls apart, an inside pack ref will call out no pack. When you hear this, you should automatically flip a switch in your brain because you are not allowed to make contact during a no pack. Your only job is to reform the pack. If you prevent or delay the pack from reforming or take on a position that inherently messes with the pack formation, then you would get an illegal position penalty. Illegal position is an umbrella term that includes destroying the pack, failure to reform, skating out of bounds, failure to yield, and failure to return. And each of these subcategories all use the same referee cue shown to the right. So first up, we have destroying the pack, which can be defined as any movement by a skater that intentionally destroys the pack. For example, Patrick down here skated up towards his own teammates, which unfortunately made it so that the pack no longer existed, and that would be grounds for a destroying the pack penalty. We also have failure to reform. So if you hear a no pack call and you don't act quickly to reform the pack, you will get a failure to reform penalty. So what you don't want to do when you hear a no pack is stand around and do nothing and be hashtag unbothered. What you do want to do is act as fast as possible to reform the pack. If you're in the front of the no pack, you must slow down to a stop. If you're in the back of the no pack, you must accelerate forward to a sprint. If you don't do either of these things during a no pack, then you go to the box. On those same lines, if a ref gives you an out of play warning because you've skated out of the engagement zone and you don't fix your position, then you will get a failure to return penalty. So failure to reform refers to the pack and failure to return refers to the engagement zone. Do not be like Patrick and just lollygag somewhere you're not supposed to, otherwise you will get a penalty. 
Okay, next we have the skating out of bounds penalty. You have to be in bounds when you're playing derby. If you skate out of bounds to avoid a hit or skate out of bounds and pick up momentum, etc., you will get called on a skating out of bounds penalty. You can see in the GIF here that the football player goes out of bounds to avoid being tackled by the other players, which is okay in football, but a great example of something you can't do in roller derby. And finally, for the illegal position penalties, we have failure to yield. This is when you start the jam in the wrong place and gain advantage from doing so. For example, if you're a jammer, you have to start behind the jam line. If your wheels are over the jam line when the starting whistle blows, you would be given a false start warning by a ref and you would need to yield the advantage that you gained by starting ahead of the jam line, right? If you're a jammer, you're supposed to start behind. So if you start in front, then you've gained this advantage and now you must say, okay, I messed up and I will yield my position. Yielding your position basically looks like letting the rest of the crowd skate past you and acknowledging that you started somewhere you weren't supposed to and then proceeding with the jam after you've yielded. If you don't yield after a false start warning, then you get a failure to yield penalty. Basically, just make sure you're starting the jam where you're allowed to start and you can refer to the graphic in the top right for legal starting positions. Wonderful. Now we are going to talk about some more penalties that you can get without even making contact. Nice. Starting off strong, please everybody listen up. This is one of the most common penalties in roller derby and one that you definitely need to know. Avoid this one at all costs, especially if you are a jammer. This is the infamous truck cut penalty. Simply put, if you end up out of bounds, you must return in bounds behind the skater that hit you out in addition to any other skater or skaters that were in front of you as you were hit out. Otherwise, you will be issued a track cut penalty. And this goes for both jammers and blockers. Now, there are exceptions to this. Number one, you'll only get a track cut if you illegally re-enter the track in front of an upright an inbound skater that had a better position than you. In other words, say the person that hit you out fell or they went out of bounds in the process of hitting you. If that's the case, then you can't get a track cut on them anymore because you can't gain position on someone who isn't upright or inbounds. Number two, same thing if a skater you re-entered the track in front of was out of play. It doesn't count as a track cut because they were out of play and they're basically a nobody if they're outside of the engagement zone. And finally, number three. Another exception to track cuts is that you can legally cut one of your own teammates, but only one. So if you re-enter in front of more than one of your own teammates, you will get a track cut. Moving on, we also have delay of game penalties, and these are given for actions that impede the standard progression of the game. For example, if you didn't feel the jammer, or if your captain used a timeout when your team didn't have any left, etc., etc. This next penalty is the illegal procedure penalty, and this is another umbrella term for just a handful of technical infractions that people can commit in roller derby. For example, you could get an illegal procedure penalty for taking your mouth guard out during a jam, if you successfully call off a jam when you're not lead jammer, if you complete an improper star pass, etc. There are lots of little infractions that fall under illegal procedure penalties. And lastly, we will go over the infamous misconduct penalty. Basically, this penalty is given to anyone that displays unsporting conduct, and this includes all participants of a roller derby game, including skaters, team staff, officials, mascots, event staff, and spectators. Of course, this is an umbrella term, but some common ways to get a misconduct are being disrespectful to officials, engaging in dangerous behavior towards another skater, and swearing that is audible to the audience. Okay, now that we've talked about the penalties of roller derby, let's talk about what happens when you actually get one. So, there can be up to seven refs watching the game at all times to catch penalties. Typically, there are three on the outside and four on the inside of the track. If you commit a penalty, one of the refs will whistle and then call your team color, your number, and the penalty you committed. 
So if I was Patrick here and I didn't return to the engagement zone, the ref would whistle and then call pink 775, failure to return. Accompanied by the referee cue and then a big pointing notion that means report to the box. Once you hear all of this get called, step immediately off to the outside of the track. Never! Skate through the middle of the track. Just immediately step off to the outside and take the shortest route to the box. You can skate derby direction or non-derby direction to get to the box, whatever is quickest. And of course, make sure that you don't run into any of the outside pack refs. Now, once you get to the box, one of the penalty box timers will signal which chair to sit in. If you're a jammer, it'll be your team's jammer seat with a star on it. Otherwise, if you're a blocker, it'll be one of your team's blocker seats with nothing on it. Your 30 seconds in the penalty box doesn't start until your butt is in the chair. So once you sit down, the countdown begins. You sit for 20 seconds and then you serve the last 10 seconds of your penalty standing. And once you've stood for the last 10 seconds, then the timer goes, okay, you're done. And then you return to the track once they release you. I also want to stress that you must enter the box in a controlled manner. If you come in hot and you knock over all the chairs or even knock one of the chairs into the penalty box timers, you will get a misconduct penalty for being reckless to an official and you'll have to serve an additional 30 seconds. In some cases, you may even get ejected, which we'll talk about in a second. So always make sure you enter the box under control. With that being said, now is a good time to talk about getting multiple penalties at once. An additional 30 seconds is added to your penalty time for each additional penalty you get. It's unfortunate, but it does happen every so often. Now, when it comes to things like penalties, your team captain or alternate can request one official review per half if they would like to dispute a call made by an official. During an official review, the head ref and other officials gather to discuss the request and decide whether an officiating error was made. So official reviews can often end up in someone going to the box for something that was originally missed in the previous jam, or it can even result in a penalty being rescinded if the officials determine that no foul was actually committed. So the main point here is that official reviews can be a useful tool to overturn a penalty. Now, before I end this video, I did want to mention a couple more things. You can foul out of a game once you accumulate seven penalties. When you foul out, you can no longer play for the remainder of the game, and it's pretty typical to gear down and watch the rest of the bout, but you aren't allowed to be back at your bench. If this happens to you, don't be hard on yourself. Just take it as a learning opportunity and remember that seven is a magic number here. Now, another way you can be removed from a game is through an expulsion. If someone acts in a way that is sufficiently dangerous or unsporting, the officials can decide to remove them from the game immediately, regardless of how many penalties they have been assessed at the time. Moral of the story here is just be a nice human. Even though roller derby is full contact and physically aggressive, it does not give anyone the right to seriously harm or be unsportsmanlike to other participants. Otherwise, you will get expelled. Bruh. Okay, so if you made it to the end of this video, thank you for sticking with me and learning about all of the many, many penalties and rules that we must abide by in the wonderful sport of roller derby. I do want to reiterate that this video is an overview, so I encourage you all to keep learning on your own and find out more as the next steps to learning the rules of roller derby and becoming a better player. Like I said in the beginning of the video, the more you know the rules, the more effective you are on the track. You know where to be, you know what to do, and you also know what not to do to make sure that you stay out of the penalty box. Now, with that being said, I wish you all the best in your roller derby journey, and please let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Have yourself a wonderful day, and I will see you all in the next jam-packed video.